Good morning, everybody. Let's all stand, and we're going to sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. To the newborn king, he on earth and mercy mild, God in sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born. Welcome to worship. Glad to have you all here. And if you're joining us, join, join us online, we're um, so glad you're joining us as well. If you would fill out your tear-offs and put them in the boxes in the back, and if you're first-time guest, you can take yours to the information center. We have a small gift just to show you. We appreciate you being here. Um, this morning, I'm going to be reading from Isaiah 7:14. Um, it's it's one of many scriptures in the Old Testament uh, foretelling the coming of a, our Messiah. And, you know, obviously we're a couple weeks from Christmas here. I thought it was appropriate, but the people of that time were waiting for their Messiah, just like we wait sometimes, as Glenn will have his sermon about that. But it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. This last week or two, I've been working on refinishing a church pew bench out of the old central church. And as I'm standing on it, I'm thinking about, I have many um, descendants or, um, you know, a grandfather and great, great something grandfathers, like three of great, great something grandfathers that were ministers there. And so I'm standing on it. I'm just kind of wishing I could sit in that bench and listen to their sermons and, um, it gives me a sense of pride, I guess, knowing that they were ministering to people and speaking truth. But as I was thinking about that, um, when we're sharing our faith with people, it doesn't really matter where we come from. It doesn't matter who we come from. It, it matters who we share. We share this Messiah, the same one Isaiah talked about. Um, we share how he's worked in our lives. Um, I can share the peace I have in a year where so many people are, you know, 
at wit's end, the peace I've had, even though there's been tough times, I've had a, a, a new sense of peace this year. Um, and likewise, as we go into worship, um, I, I'm not going to ride into heaven on the coattails of those grandfathers. I'm not going to ride in on the coattails of Dale Wise. He's given me free choice, and, and I choose him. I love him because he loved me first. And it's, he's got a beautiful plan, and that giving us free, free will, I think, helps us to experience his love. So let's, uh, let's worship him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are an awesome, awesome God, and thank you for that free will choice you give us. Thank you that you loved us, for, loved, loved us first. Um, so that we can truly experience your grace and your mercy and learn how to love others. God, as we go into worship here as a family, we just pray that you would fill us. Fill us with your spirit. Give us what we need. A, a, creating us something new, a new desire to know you better today. Just give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head oh, I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been Of the goodness. 
I searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise And treasures the faith And never enough And you came along And put me back together Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again.
weekend we have the opportunity to vote for an elder uh, to take the place of this the place vacated by Caitlin Roth on leadership team and just uh, opportunity to to put them in place um, we've got these ballots here that are in your bulletins and if you didn't get a bulletin or didn't get a ballot there are more ballots in the back this is a members only vote so members if you would take this and uh, mark the box that that you've chosen and put it in the box in the back uh, on your way out, that would be um, a great uh, service. Um, Sharon Evers has been transferred to UMC, UTMC today. 
So she had been waiting, uh, and we thought she was going to go a couple days ago, but she's finally able to go. A, a room has opened up for her, so we want to give praise for that. And thirdly, these flowers are in remembrance of Jennifer and Abigail Yoder. Uh, it's 10 years this week that they passed away in a tragic car accident. Um, this would be a daughter-in-law and granddaughter of Lamar and Diane Yoder, a sister-in-law and niece to Brad and Val Nafziger, a sister-in-law and niece to Kirk and Gail Yoder, and a wife and daughter to Doug Yoder, all who have been part of our congregation for a long time. So we want to lift them up in our prayers this week uh, as you think about them and just uh, continue to, to pray over them and uh, mention an encouraging word to them if you see them. So let's bow for prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the opportunity to gather and to sing, sing praises to you and just honor you and, and lift you up and worship Father, we just ask that you would just receive that, that offering, that it would be pleasing to your ears, that, that you would be blessed by the proclamation of your name. Father, we thank you for being with us in the mountaintops and in the valleys, all the same. We thank you for your faithfulness to who you are and your faithfulness to us as your people. We thank you for your love that you shower upon us, even though we don't deserve it. So, Father, I just... We just want to give you, give you thanks and give you praise this morning for that. Father, it can be easy for us to take for granted the blessings that you shower upon us and to take for granted your, your presence. And so, Father, I just ask that, that you would forgive us when we do that, when we are not attentive to your word, when we're not attentive to your spirit. But, Father, we just uh, want to give you thanks for, for continuing to, to be faithful to us. Father, we want to lift up folks in our congregation this morning that are struggling with health. Father, we specifically uh, think of um, Laura Jane and Sharon and Luann and Lena and Faye and Matt and Diane. Think of Jim and Geraldo and Kim. And Father, as they're, as they're struggling with health, as they're not well, we just ask that you would just comfort them and guide them and be alongside them. Whether they are dealing with illness or whether they're recovering from surgery, Father, we just ask that you would just uh, give them strength. And Father, just uh, invite them into your presence. Father, we thank you for your ability to heal, and we thank you for in Scripture where it says that everyone who came to Jesus was healed. So, Father, we thank you for your ability to heal us physically. We thank you for healing our hearts where we lack, where we have need. So, Father, I just ask that you would just guide our hearts closer to you. Father, we lift up the elder discernment process to you. We just we know that you have a plan for our leadership, and we and we are so thankful for the way that you include us in your plan. We're so thankful for what you've called us to here as a congregation, and just ask that that the vote today would would reflect uh, your desire and your heart. We just ask that that the person selected would uh, would serve well with the other leaders. That it would be a a team together that's seeking after you. And Father, just ask your blessing also on, on those who aren't chosen. We know that, that you have uh, plans for them as well in that, and, and that they are leaders here in our congregation as well, even if they don't hold a position. So Father, we just ask that you would just be amidst that vote today, amidst that process. Father, we want to give you thanks for Pastor Glenn this morning and, and his faithfulness to bringing your word to us. We want to give you praise for uh, his commitment to that. So, Father, we just ask that you would just give us open ears and hearts to hear and receive your word for us today, that we might take it and apply it in our lives each and every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. If your Bibles, if you would turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, starting with verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to those men to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, 
Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which I, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but I will baptize, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same, Jesus who has, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back, and in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. They returned to Jerusalem from the hill called Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from town. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they had been staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. I really appreciated this last song that we sang here tonight, or this morning, I guess. The this, this song says this, it says, Oh, how high would I climb mountains if the mountains were where you hide? Oh, how far I'd scale the valleys if you graced the other side? Oh, how long have I chased rivers from lowly seas to where they rise against a rush of grace descending from the source of its supply? And the chorus says, Because in the highlands and in the heartache you're neither more or less inclined. I would search and stop at nothing. You're just not that hard to find. And the chorus again, so I will praise you in the mountain, and I will praise you in the mountains in my way. You're the summit where my feet are, so I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadows, no less faithful when the night leads me astray, because you're the heaven where my heart is, in the highlands and the heartache all the same. Oh, how far beneath your glory does your kindness extend the path from where your feet rest on the sunshine to where you sweep the sinner's path. Oh, how fast you would come running if you just to shadow me through the night, trace my steps through my failures, and walk me out the other side. For who could dare ascend the mountain, that valley, hill called Calvary, but for the one I call good shepherd, who like a lamb was slain for me. Whatever I walk through, whatever I am, your name can move mountains wherever I stand. And if I walk through the valley of death, I'll sing through the shadows of my song of ascent. From the gravest of all valleys come the pastures we call grace, a mighty river flowing upwards from a deep but empty grave. We're continuing this series on waiting on God, and today we're talking about what it means to prayerfully wait on God, and I, I'm not sure about you, I know that I don't do well on the waiting. I've always struggled with the waiting. I, I'm the guy that when I pull up to the railroad tracks in northwest Ohio and there's a train going, instead of waiting on the train, I'll drive around the mile, right? Because I, there's got to be movement. Why wait? And sometimes you get around to the other side and you look in your rearview mirror and you realize that had I just waited, I would probably already be at this place without having to drive. But it feels like there's movement. December is always a month for me for a long time now that makes me stop and think about all that God does and how he works in mysterious ways. It was 11 years ago, about right now, that we felt, I felt the call in, in September that God was saying it's time to transition from where I was pastoring in eastern Ohio. And I, I thought when God spoke to me that he should at least have some clarity and know where he wants me to be within a week. And a week came and went, and I didn't have clarity. And I thought, well, okay, at least two weeks. It shouldn't be that bad. Two weeks, I'll for sure know. And, and months went by. And it was about this time, 11 years ago, when we finally heard from North Clinton's search team, and we felt for sure that this was where God wanted us to go. And then we waited another month before we met with them. 
it was 10 years ago, a couple, well, two months maybe from before this, that in a sermon I preached, I said one Sunday morning, I said, I, I don't understand after I moved to Northwest Ohio why there's a stop sign every mile. Do you people not know how to look? You can see for miles. And, and I made a comment in the sermon. I said, for two cars to meet in an intersection, the timing has to be so impeccably perfect for something to happen. And then about a month and a half or two months later, Doug and Jennifer and Abigail were driving to Toledo, and the perfect timing happened, and Jennifer and Abigail were killed in a car accident because the timing was perfect. For months after that, I struggled because, like, God, why did I say that on a Sunday morning? And I look like an idiot, and I'm, I mean, I, I hurt the family, and how could I do that? It was four years ago today that I looked down the barrel of a gun when someone was having a real rough day and, and shot his girlfriend, and I was shot at. And I've asked myself the question, why? Why am I here? And, and I say all that because I know that we're here today and all of us are dealing with stuff in life. We deal with the things that we're waiting on. You're waiting on an illness to be healed. You're waiting on a relationship to be fixed. You're waiting on a job to get better. You're waiting on a family member to be at a place that you want. You're waiting and we're waiting. And no matter what it is we're waiting for, it's real. You know, I remember as a little boy when I was six or seven, when I would go coon hunting with my knife, I, with my father at night, I can remember those times, maybe one o'clock in the morning or 12, 30 or one, and I would pray. I would say, God, could you please help us find the dog? I just want to go home. And when you're coon hunting, you know that sometimes the dog starts chasing deer or a coon and they get far away and you can't find them and you got to find the dog before you go home and we're wandering around in the woods and and I'm exhausted and I'm tired and I just want to go home. And I'm like, God, will you answer this prayer? And, and, and regardless of our age and regardless of what we're dealing with, God knows what we're dealing with. And he wants us to wait on him. And, and as that song that we sang right before says, no matter where we go, the highlands or the valleys, God is there. Ten years ago when I was talking and walking this journey with Doug, I remember a word that God gave me was, this. He said, you know, we always like the mountaintops. And we've some of us have been to mountaintops. I, I've been on the top of Pikes Peak, and I've been on the top of San Francisco Peaks in Arizona and some other mountains. And when you're on top of the mountain, you can see forever. The, the view is exquisite. It's awesome. It's gorgeous. But the animals always go to the valley to find food because there's no water at the top of the mountain. There's no grass at the top of the mountain. The food is in the valley, and I believe for us as a people, the growing is in the valley. The mountaintops keep us moving to the next place. In this passage today, we read about these disciples that had been following Jesus for three years. They were waiting and waiting and waiting because they knew that when the Messiah came, things were going to change, and they were expecting that when the Messiah came, they would overthrow the Roman government, and they would finally be in charge. They would take over, and they were waiting. And Jesus has now been through three years of ministry. He's been through crucifixion, death. He rose from the grave, and he's looking at his disciples, and he says, I want you to go back to town, and I want you to wait. And you're waiting for the gift that I've promised you. John baptized with water, but I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. They didn't know what the Holy Spirit was. They didn't know who the Holy Spirit was. They wasn't sure how it was going to function. They had some moments where they functioned in ministry by the power of the Holy Spirit, but they weren't completely filled with the Holy Spirit, and they had never had that baptism. They weren't sure what it was. And Jesus said, I want you to go back to town and wait. And they said, so, Jesus, does this mean... At that moment, you're going to restore the kingdom of God to Israel? We're going to overthrow the Romans? It's going to be better? And God was saying to them, just wait. You see, it's important for us to learn from the disciples that 
Waiting on God, it's not uncommon that our expectations of God's moving is not the same as ours. He works in different ways. He works in different time spans, and he has a plan. The psalmist David said it really well when he said it this way in Psalm 37. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. We know that waiting can be really difficult. And whatever it is that you're waiting on today, I want you to know that we care. And I want you to know that God knows all about it. And so I want to just give us a couple of things that I was reminded of as I read and studied this passage, and hopefully it's helpful to you. I believe it's important when we wait that we prayerfully wait. The disciples went into a house, and they waited on the Holy Spirit. It says, they all joined together costly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, his brothers. You see, prayer is the way that we get in tune with God. I, when, when we pray, so often it's easy for us to get our mindset to thinking that, okay, God, it's important for me to line you up to help you figure it out, to get your timing right, to help you know how to move. But prayer is the opposite. It's a way for me to release all that I am and all that I do to God. The, the disciples were modeling what it means to be instead of what it means to do. We, it's easier to do, I can tell you. It's much easier to do. It's much easier when I'm sitting down here by 16 and I want to cross the tracks. It's easier to drive to 17 or 18 or go around and go this way. When I go home, when I go across and I go down the pass, and down past the cemetery, and when I turn to the corner of the cemetery and I look to the south and I know i got to go across the tracks and two-tenths or three-tenths of a mile to the west, and there's a train coming. If I drive one more mile, I can go under the viaduct, come back, and I don't have to wait. But it doesn't necessarily save time. And when I'm driving, it does prevent me to just some common thinking time. And, and when we think and sit and wait on God, it changes the, the mindset of our mind. In 2 Chronicles, the writer says it this way. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. 2 Thessalonians, Paul said it this way. He said, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's important for us to learn from the disciples what it means to prayerfully wait on God. It also means we need to listen to God. When, when Jesus told the disciples, he says, go back to town and wait in that room, it's important that we listen to him. They were afraid. They were afraid because the people believed that the disciples, those that were non-believers, believed that the disciples took the body of Christ out of the grave. They didn't believe that he rose from the grave. And so they believed that, that the disciples went, took Jesus' body out of the grave, the tomb, and, and, and hid him somewhere just to make them think that he rose from the grave. And so they, they were dealing with the people, and, and they needed to listen to God. They needed to get back in that room. They needed to appoint someone to take the place of Judas Iscariot because they needed to have the 12 because that was part of God's commission. And it actually represented a lot of things, right? So there was 12 tribes of Israel. There needed to be 12 moving forward. And so the God had a plan, a perfect plan, and he wanted to make it work out. I mean, the math doesn't work out in the book of Revelation if you don't have 12 disciples and 12 tribes of Israel because you can't get 144 if you don't have 12 times 12. And, and we can go on and on. The reality is, is God had a plan. He said, go back to the house and wait. And waiting is tough. But they did it. And when they listened to God, God began to do some amazing, amazing things. Now, there, 
They, they were waiting on God and they listened to him. They, they listened like Abraham. Abraham before them, he waited on God for years and years. And we know from a couple of weeks ago, I talked about it in the sermon, when Abraham got tired of waiting on God, he took matters into his own hand. He followed the custom of the law and he had a child with Hagar, but it created a conflict that even today is still alive and well because he didn't wait. The apostle, the, the apostle Paul, and we're going to hear about him next week, the apostle Paul Paul was on his way to Damascus. God brought a bright light down. He was blinded. He went back to town. And when he was in town, he was waiting on God. And he had to wait for Ananias to come and pray for him, lay hands on him and pray for him. But we read nothing more about Ananias. Ananias is only talked about, this Ananias is only talked about in Scripture when he came to Paul, laid hands on him and prayed for him. But Paul waited for three days. For three days, it says, he fasted and he prayed, waiting on God. Ananias laid hands on him. He was healed of his blindness, and he began to preach, and amazing things happened. In fact, we have over half of the New Testament because the Apostle Paul listened to God. The Israelites, they waited and waited on God, and he finally led them out of Egypt to the Promised Land, And then they had to wander through the wilderness for 40 years for all the old people to die off so they could go into the promised land. And and in case you're wondering what old was, is they had to get everybody that was over the age of 40 gone because they didn't listen to God. And then, get this, they finally get to the promised land after wandering around the desert for 40 years. They get to the promised land. They're to cross the River Jordan. And the first thing they're going to come to is the most fortified city of their time, Jericho. Now, if God can part the Red Sea, if God can part the waters of the Jordan, why couldn't God wipe out Jericho, bam, just like that? But you know what God did? God said to them, he said, I want you to go and I want you to march around Jericho once a day for six days. And then I want you to go back the seventh day, and I want you to march around that city seven times. Why? God could have wiped out Jericho after the first visit. God could have wiped out Jericho after the second visit. God could have wiped out Jericho after the third visit. He could have done it at any time. In fact, he could have done it without even marching. And on the seventh time, as they're marching around the city, it was like, whoa, like, They were singing and shouting. They were so loud they had tambourines and drums. I mean, it sounded like a death metal rock concert, right? It was loud, and it was so much force there that the walls came down. Why did God do that? He needed the Israelites to know that he was in charge. And so they were waiting on him. Do you imagine what the stories were like for years after that? Every time they told the story about that incident and the people said, you know, we went over and we marched right around the city walls of the most fortified city in the world. We did that every day for seven days and nothing happened to us. And on the seventh day, on the seventh time, the walls came crashing down when we started praising God. It built up character within them. And waiting on God, it always builds up character. But that's the toughest thing for us. Naaman, he was this great army general. People would do everything he wanted. He would tell them to go and they would go. He would tell them to do something they would do it. And he heard about Elisha. He had, he had leprosy. And he heard about Elisha. And so he went to the man of God. He went to the man of God and said, they tell me you're great. I have all these these animals loaded with all kinds of stuff, clothes and silver and gold and food and packs and packs of stuff. All you have to do, Elisha, is heal me. That was, that was Naaman's plan. Before he got to Elisha, God spoke to Elisha, and Elisha sent his servant to meet Naaman. And he said, um, Oh, yeah, the man of God said, just go to the River Jordan and dip in the River Jordan seven times. The dirtiest river around, dip in it seven times, and you'll be healed. And Naaman's thinking, he didn't even come and talk to me. He didn't even take my gift. So he decided just to go home. And his, his servant said, Naaman, why wouldn't you listen to him? You, you do great things with the military. Why can't you do this, what you're asked to do? And so he went. And, and he dipped in the river, and he came up, and he said, there's nothing. And it says that he, he dipped, and every time he dipped, he looked. Nothing. 
But on the seventh time it happened. Well, he had to wait on God. And then it happened and it changed things. It changed his character. It changed how he thought about life. You see, listening to God is important and it leads to a moving of the Spirit. We have to wait and it's important that we do it in prayer because it helps to line us up with Him. But we also know from Scripture that when we wait on God, people will not always agree with that. Go to chapter 2 of Acts. It says this. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews of every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one had heard, each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How then is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthens, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Persia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretan and Arabs. We hear them declaring the praise, the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, thought they were drunk because they were so filled with the Holy Spirit. If you look at a map, all these nations that are talked about are countries that surround the Mediterranean Sea. And then they go east into what is now modern-day Turkey and the United Arab immigrants in those countries. All of those people, says, were represented in this city, and they're all hearing in their own language. And, and then they were thinking that the disciples were drunk because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, when we, when we listen to God's Spirit and we wait on Him, people won't always agree because it doesn't line up with our culture. God doesn't move in a timing that correlates to the people that we live with. God doesn't work with a timing that makes everybody happy. For example, the Apostle Paul, who wrote over half of the New Testament, he was stoned. He was beaten by whips because he was faithful to God. The disciples, they were hiding in their room because they were afraid of God. John the Revelator was sent into an island of Patmos to reach to, to give this vision he had of God because he needed to get away from people. Job, in chapter 2, he was covered with boils. God had taken everything, God had allowed everything to be taken away from him. He was being tested. And even his own wife said this. She said, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Job was waiting on God and his own wife said, curse God and die. Be done with this. You get to chapter 19 of Job, and it gets really interesting. Job has now been listening to his friends. His three friends come to visit him, right? And they're talking to him, and they're giving him all kinds of flack because he's not cursing God, and he's waiting on God. Listen to what he says. Chapter 19, verse 2. How long will you torment me and crush me with words? Ten times now you have reproached me, shameless me, shamelessly you attack me. Job is looking at his friends, he's saying, how can you keep doing this to me? Ten times you've been attacking me. You've been reproaching me and saying all this negative stuff. I'm waiting on God. And then he says what is maybe some of the most beautiful words in Scripture at the end of chapter 19 of Job. His, his friends have cut him down and tore him down. He's already heard the negative from his wife, and he's still waiting on God, and he says this. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end He will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God and I myself will see Him with my own eyes. I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Job, in the midst of this terrible difficulty. He's lost everything. His friends have turned against him. His wife's turned against him. Everybody has turned against him. He knows it's important to wait on God. And whatever it is that you're waiting on God for today, don't stop. Don't stop because it's worth it. Because here's what we know. We know that God's timing produces exponential results. I love that word, exponential. Say it with me exponential. No, come on, like from down in here. Exponential. You know what it means? 
It's like multiplying beyond your wildest expectation. It's multiplying faster than you can imagine. It's growing beyond your comprehension. It's exponential. It's a, it's, there you go, exponential. Say it again, exponential. Yeah, it's a great word. And when we follow and listen to God, it's exponential results. Let's go back to Acts chapter 2, shall we? Acts chapter 2, verse 40 says this. This is at the end of Peter's sermon. After he's been filled with the Holy Spirit and he's been teaching all of these people from all of this area around the Mediterranean Sea and into what is now modern-day Turkey and other places, he says this. With many words he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. Job, we just talked about Job, right? You go to chapter 42, and it's really cool. Job 42, verse 10, Job is modeling what it means to wait on the Lord in his timing. And he says this. This again, remember, it's after his friends have rebuked him. It's after his wife has told him that he should curse God. He does this. It says, after Job had prayed for his friends. After he prayed for his friends, the ones that were humiliating him and cursing him and running him down, after he prayed for them, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Now, I'm not telling you that when something leaves and you lose something, that God's going to give you twice as much back. That's not the principle here. The principle is, when Job listened to God, God did exponential things in his life. And he does that for all of us. It doesn't mean it's going to come in the form of dollars and cents. It means it's going to come in a blessing that is filled with the Holy Spirit in our life. If you get to Matthew chapter 14, Jesus and his disciples have been out along the lake, and they've been preaching and teaching and sharing with the people. And it says that the people got hungry, and they came to the disciples, and they're asking for something to eat. And they go to Jesus, and they say, Jesus, there's... There's a lot of people here. We need to send them home so they can get some food because it's late in the day and they're hungry. Jesus says, well, why don't you feed them? Like, Jesus, we're like, we're like 2,000 years away from McDonald's and at least 25 miles from where it might be if there was one. There's no way we can feed them. There's no Chick-fil-A close because Chick-fil-A is the only one that can feed that many people in a short period of time because they got an organization, right? We, what are we going to do? Jesus says, we, we, have, we have Long John Silvers. We have bread and fish. And it's right here. And, and the interesting thing is, is when they submitted themselves to God, they took these loaves and fishes. I don't think it happened just like this, like boom, 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 and they're done. I think it was a process. If Jesus said to you to get food for 5,000 men plus women and children, probably closer to twelve or 15,000 people, would you show up with two fishes or two loaves of bread and five fishes? Would you, would you have the courage to say, um, here, Jesus, you want to feed them? I wouldn't. But they did. And they went to Jesus and they said, we found a couple of loaves and some fishes. And it says he prayed over it and they broke it and passed it out to the people. And when they were done, there was 12 baskets full left over because they waited on God. I'm not sure what you're dealing with today, but I'm positive that what you're dealing with is very real to you. It may be really painful, it may not be as painful, but it's real. And, and I know that as we wait on God, this passage reminds us that we do it together. And so I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing this closing song. If you would like to be prayed with, or prayed for. If you come, we have a team that will pray with you. Come down and we will be glad to pray with you. But wait on God's timing. Wait on Him prayerfully.
and allow ourselves to hear him as he moves and leads us. The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth a thrill of hope the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn Thank you so much for the reminder to us to wait on you. God, we confess, I confess, it's hard to wait. Your timing doesn't seem to be right always, and it doesn't seem like you always know what I need right now, but I know you do, God, and so I just pray that you will help us to refocus our eyes and to wait on you. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break for the slave is our Of joy, 
Thank you.